Hello. 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 Oh, there you are. Good. All right. We're uh, we're just having a break after the film screening's conclusion, and so we're just getting you lined up here. Cool. It'll be two or three minutes till we start. Okay. Thank you. All right. There we go. Is everything nice shirt, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you too. Is everything looking okay at your end? It looks good. It looks good. Good. All right. We'll get everybody together here in just a moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can see you see the screen in the bottom there. <laughs> Hey James. Yes, you can see there. There's How's it there. going? You can see what he's yeah. seeing there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Check check. Can you still can you still hear us, Ellie? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. All right. Well, anyway, thank you very much for the lovely film, Ellie. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming out on a Friday night to see a film about circumcision. <laughs> all right. That was, uh, we'll. Uh, you can introduce yourself and ask your. If we have a couple questions. Uh, here we go with the first couple. Here we go. Hey. I can you hear me okay? Yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, my name's Tim, and I just had a couple questions about the film. Uh, number one, is there any way to get any place uh, we could go to get uncut copies of the inter interviews that were included in the film? Um, no, I have not made um, the complete interviews from the film accessible anywhere. Um, and so, yeah, the short answer to that is no, I'm afraid not. Okay, fair enough. And also, I was kind of wondering just how the woman could possibly claim that the pain she was causing the infant was not her fault. So you're talking about um, Dr. Marx, the Mohelet. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah you know, she's a, she's a really interesting character in the film. And I think um, one of the things that you see in the sort of, in the actual circumcision scene toward the end of the film is you see her kind of being forced by the presence of the camera to um, verbalize like an internal dialogue that's going on in herself. Like I think for the first time in many, many years, the presence of the camera forced her to actually, you know, sort of uh, consciously think about what she was doing. Um, and I, I think, you know, when we think about the, the sorts of um, the psychological impact of circumcision, of course, we talk about the impact uh, psychological impact on the individual uh, and the person uh, that that uh, 
individual grows up to be. We talk about the impact uh, on the parents and uh, sort of on larger society. But one of the uh, groups of people that we often forget to talk about um, are the people who are doing it. Uh, and I think um, what you were seeing with Dr. Marx is a sort of unraveling of a defense mechanism that um, practitioners of circumcision uh, are forced to engage with. They're, they're forced to build this kind of defense mechanism around what they're doing. Uh, I know that Dr. Fleiss, uh, who's a, a retired pediatric surgeon uh, in California, uh, said that he literally did not hear the babies crying after a certain point, and it took a, a, a sort of a realization, like an awakening, to get him to even literally be able to hear the crying anymore. So when you have those sorts of mechanisms in place, I think what you're seeing with Dr. Marx is the in that scene that the, the unraveling of that mechanism for the first time in a long time. So how could they not hear the crying, like, given how loud it is? <laughs> right, no, I mean, that's it's such a dramatic thing to think about, right? Like, that you could be there, it's this piercing shriek, uh, and, and we know actually from uh, acoustic analyses that it's a, it has a unique acoustic signature. The cry of an infant uh, having their genitals cut has a unique acoustic signature. It's, it's a really heart-wrenching cry. How is it possible that a person could literally not hear it? And, and what I have to, the only explanation I can offer you is when you are doing that to someone over and over and over to different people, um, your brain has to accommodate that and I think it, it shuts off the parts of the brain that would normally hear. Yeah. All right. Thanks, very much. Thanks for your question, Tim. Thank you very much. I have a question, uh, Elia. Tell me about some of the stuff that didn't make it into the film. Is there any really good stuff that, that didn't get in? Um, you know, there's there's stuff, there is quite a bit of stuff that didn't get in. Um, I would say that the, the most obvious thing that comes to my mind um, is the first diaper change. I got footage of the first diaper change after the, the circumcision at the end of the film. And um, it was really um, quite gruesome. Um, the penis had swollen to about five times uh, its normal size, and it was bright red. Um, and I remember Dr. Marks telling the parents not to expect it to look normal, you know, normal for a number of years. Um, and I actually felt that the footage was too graphic. Uh, I, it's a graphic film, but I felt like that was sort of crossing a line. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I did want it to be graphic and I, I did want it to, to really show the procedure, but I wasn't going for a sort of shock uh, tactic. That was not my intention with the film, and so that's the reason that footage never made it in. Hey, Ellie. Where is the film playing now? You did the tour around North America, and uh, is this typical of how the film is on release now, the community groups to playing it in coffee houses, or what's, what's going on and what's next? Right. So, I mean, you're, yeah, we had the tour and uh, that was wonderful. And Glenn was, uh, was the organizer for the Vancouver branch, which was fantastic, um, which is where I got this lovely shirt, um, which you can get. Where can you get it, Glenn? Here's a here's, plug it. Plug it. You can get it at canfap.net. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, I hope that people will continue watching the film. Um, we've made it uh, available via video on demand. I know in Canada that's not possible right now to get it because uh, it's through Amazon, but we're working on video on demand for uh, international territories as well through another uh, provider. We have the DVD for sale on the website. Um, and, you know, for me, the next step in this project is actually um, not going to be in film. I'm thinking about writing a book, um, and I, for me, um, the next step in, in my process for this project is really to write a book from a Jewish traditional perspective, uh, arguing from Jewish traditional sources about how to move beyond this. So um, I don't have much more to say about that right now, but I think that that's the next step for me. Bravo.
Hello. Hi, Abby. Hi, Kira. Um, thank you so much for everything, all of your work with the film. Um, I just wondered if you could very quickly comment a little bit on the news piece from Germany. Sure. So it's 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 a really interesting uh, summer, um, and it, it's it's really interesting that it followed almost exactly a year from the San Francisco ballot in, initiative. Um, and I, I think, um, first of all, I, I want to restate for the record that I think that I can't think of a single reason uh, for circumcision to be legal anywhere. So that just let's just be absolutely clear about that. Um, in general, I'm in, in principle, I'm in favor of uh, this being illegal because I think that um, we're talking about some of the most vulnerable people in society, infants, and I think they need to be protected, uh, male infants just as, as much as female infants. Having said that, um, I think the situation in Europe is different than it is in the United States uh, and in North America, but m mostly different from the United States in the sense that um, the majority of circumcisions that occur in the United States uh, are done in a hospital setting. They're medical circumcisions. Um, and so when you pass a law, uh, you know, if eventually that happens in this country, what you're doing is uh, very quickly eliminating the vast majority of circumcisions. You're basically telling uh, hospitals that they can't do this anymore. Uh, and I believe that if a law like that were passed in the United States, it would have dramatic, a dramatic impact um, where it's most needed in the United States, which is the majority of circumcisions, i.e. hospitals. In Europe, it's different. In Europe, um, the vast majority of circumcisions are religious circumcisions, uh, Jewish and Muslim circumcisions. And so while I still believe that circumcision should not be legal, um, I think there's a very interesting and important discussion that needs to occur in, in uh, activist circles around this issue about whether this is the wisest course of action in a European context. Uh, and let me, let me explain uh, why I'm saying that. Um, if we take the American example again for a second, um, you would basically eliminate hospital circumcisions Oops, by making... Uh, Ellie, we're, we're, you're breaking up a little bit here. I think we have to... Uh re-sync re or something here. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah okay. Okay. That would be good. Uh, okay. Where, did, where did I leave off? We were talking about the uh, way of approaching the European situation. How right. do you approach it correctly? Right. So, so in the United States, by passing a law, you'd basically eliminate hospital circumcisions. Um, and that would be a huge win. Um, in Europe, you were you would really be sort of the law would be targeting religious circumcision and i i'm not saying that that it's necessarily the wrong thing to do but i think that there's an argument a very good argument to be made that it's not a wise course of action for the reason the the, the specific reason that um religious people don't really react well to those sorts of tactics um, I'm talking about this coming from, you know, having grown up as a religious person. Um, and I can tell you that uh, to Jewish ears, even in the United States where it's clearly not targeting Jews and Muslims, but even in the United States there was this sort of nervousness around the San Francisco ballot initiative, this sort of overreaction. And the, the, the way it sounded to Jewish ears was that, you know, you're, you're coming after our traditions, not we're trying to protect babies, but you're coming after our traditions in Europe. Um, where the majority of circumcisions are religious, where there is a history of religious and ethnic intolerance, um, I think that that message would be amplified. And again, I'm not trying to make any sort of definitive statement here, but I, I, I do think that there's a very interesting discussion to have um, from a tactical perspective about what the best way to go about um, ending religious infant circumcision in Europe is, which may be different from the United States. Thank you. Sure. Oh, real quick one. I think we've got one more for you. Yeah, so regarding the DVD, uh, what sort of uh, bonus materials do you have on there, if any? Sure. Um, so we have um, uh, pretty uh, 
interesting expanded segment on restoration. Uh, we talked to some of the uh, guys uh, back when I made the film. I was living in Chicago, so some of the Chicago contingent of foreskin uh, restorers, including Ron Lau, who goes into a little bit more detail uh, with his TLC Tugger, uh, and Greg Baris, uh, who's the head of the Norm chapter down there. So there's a segment on that. Um, there's a bit of an expanded segment on um, the Jewish perspective. Um, and uh, there's a little bit in there that I really love that didn't make the film where my father talked about um, the possibility of there being revolutions in religious traditions and how things change, things can change. Uh, and then there's uh, two other special features that I think are really, really wonderful that people, most people don't even know about, but I spent a lot of time on it and I'm very proud about them. Um, one of them is a live anatomical demonstration of a foreskin. Um, so we have a live model uh, retracting uh, a foreskin and talking about the different areas of skin, so you can actually see that. Um, and then there are these color-coded slides uh, where you have uh, circumcised and intact penises side by side uh, where you can advance with your DVD remote and the color overlays go on and off of the photographs of the penises. Uh, so, yeah, really some great educational uh, extra features there. Okay. All right, we have another question for you. Hi, Emily. My name's Caroline. And uh, my question is, having made the film and done all this research and become kind of an expert, how do you handle it when the topic comes up in your daily life with other people who don't know you've made the film or, you know, surely it comes up for you like it comes up for the rest of us. Like, how do you, how do you handle that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, first of all, I'm early on in my career. Cut was my first film and I'm only coming to the end of the process of making my second feature length documentary now. So it comes up often, you know, uh, someone says, what do you do? And I say, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Oh, what have you made? Well, you know, I made this film cut. And then, you know, so it, it does come up, uh, especially when I'm ne meeting new people, you know, quite frequently. Um, I find that um, you've got to play it by ear, you know. It's a person-by-person -person kind of a thing. And you just need to sort of be very aware uh, of like where the people you're talking to are coming from and maybe even ask, you know, are you uh, ready to learn new information about this subject? Um, and if they say yes, then you can proceed, you know, sort of be very aware of who you're talking to. Um, and for me, it's, yeah, it's really just a person by person kind of thing. Sometimes uh, I find myself not being able to hold back if I'm talking to an expectant parent and they're telling me about how they plan on circumcising their kid. Um, Depending on the context, I will sometimes launch into a very passionate sort of diatribe, you know, hopefully with a little bit of humor mixed in there. Um, but, you know, sometimes you, you feel the, a moral responsibility, really, to, to say something. And other times it's just really better to shut up. Um, <laughs> like, honestly, um, and, and, and don't feel bad about it. Like, there are some situations where you're... Uh, sharing this information will be counterproductive and you just need to be aware of when those situations arise and just shut up. Thank you. Sure. sure I have another question for you. you. You, We went on tour last year to like 30 different cities and I want to ask what are some of the the most amazing experiences or mind-blowing experiences that you had on that tour? Things that you didn't expect that came out with work or whatever? Yeah, that's a, it's a big question. It was uh, 60 days of my life. They were very intense days. Um, I think, you know, it's hard to put it, to sum it up really, but, um, you know, I'll start by saying that I went to parts of the country that I would never have otherwise gone to, um, like West Virginia, um, you know, the Deep South, um, and... You know, to a certain extent, I'm like really a fish out of water there. Like, you know, I'm sort of Jewish and, you know, intellectual and northern and, you know, liberal and um, like things that, you know, you, you feel I'm not I'm not saying that there aren't people who are like that down there, but they're not in the majority. Um, 
And so I was, you know, very much a fish out of water. Um, and what was incredible to me is that me, you know, Eli Unger Sargon, you know, raised an Orthodox Jew, um, you know, with all of my liberal baggage and everything, I make a film and I go down uh, to the Deep South and people responded to it and people connected with it. And, you know, we might not have agreed on other things, but they were able to connect with, with me through the film. Um, and that was, that was kind of mind blowing. Um, there was another moment, uh, in Chicago, uh, my father came to one of the screenings and someone in the audience asked, uh, you know, about the San Francisco ballot initiative. And, um, I asked them if they wanted to hear what my father had to say. And they, the, they said, Oh, I know what your father would say about that. And my father said, uh, no, you wouldn't. You, how, why do you think you'd know what I'd say? And then the person was, of course, taken aback. And my father proceeded to basically say, you know, if more than a million uh, boys are being circumcised every year in the United States, maybe San Francisco taking the lead on this is not such a bad thing. Um, that kind of blew me away. Uh, my father was definitely not there when, we fin when I finished making the film. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, he's gone through a process of understanding and enlightenment um, and that's been like a remarkably healing thing for me also in, in our relationship to sort of realize that, you know, you saw a little bit at, at, of it at the end of the film, but I mean, it, it, it's really, it's, it's an amazing thing that we were able, despite the fact that, you know, he's such a committed, devoted religious Jew, he was able to see where I was coming from and it actually changed the way he thought about it. Okay, do, do we have any other questions? I think everybody is very happy at this point, Ellie. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank everybody. Thank you, Ellie. There you go. Right there. And if you guys want to... Thank you for uh, time for us tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank you opinion. guys so much. If you want to keep up with the film and everything that's going on, www.cutthefilm.com. Um, my latest project, the one that I'm you know, in post-production now, hopefully going to be finishing soon, it's called The People Without a Land. It's a documentary about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. To learn more about that, you can go to www.withoutaland.com. Um, so thank you so much for coming out, and thanks for the great conversation. Thanks for everything, guys. All right. Thanks, thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>